Its striking hooks and power surging cords are a tribute to blue collar workers everywhere. It's the kind of album that you don't even have to skip a song. The lyrics work, the music work, the groove work. It's still an album you can turn on and jam to. Its tracks are tough and tender, racy and sexy. I think it spoke to a lot of teenagers. I saw you on the video. Now throw your underwear at me, please! Slippery when wet flew off shelves at a platinum pace. And five guys from New Jersey happily reaped the rewards. We just had a blast. The girls went absolutely out of their mind. We got away with a murder. Decades later, its songs still resonate with the public. When you're singing truth, people feel it, and it lasts forever. Bon Jovi's Slippery When Wet is an ultimate album. Sounds polished and powerful, raucous yet romantic. It throbs with passion. And not since the boss Bruce Springsteen has New Jersey unleashed such a musical tour de force. Bon Jovi's Slippery When Wet conquered the charts in 1986 with its mix of rock and pop. Every one wet was the dream come true. It's an anthem quality that goes all the way to your heart. It was an album that had songs in it that everybody can relate to and that everybody could, could sing along with. It makes you want to be a rock star. It definitely hypes you up, makes you dream, and it makes you uh, just want to be on stage and rock out. It sold tens of millions, produced two monster hits, and launched five guys from New Jersey into the rock and roll limelight. So tell me, the truth, this People not only remember where they were when they first heard You Give Love a Bad Name or, or Living on a Prayer or any of those, they remember everything about Bon Jovi. He was sweeping across America. We'd look outside the window and people were screaming and yelling and it was just incredible. It's like riding a rocket ship to uh, fame and stardom. We couldn't go anywhere. We had to wear disguises if we wanted to go out. Let's go! Slippery When Wet remains a rocking revelation for fans of both sexes. If you're from there like John, you're gonna have a lot of pretty girls. The girls drag down their boyfriends, and that's how we get the guys in. It's like they're tough enough for guys and they're hot enough for girls. I had a huge John Bon Jovi poster on my wall and I prayed to it every night. And that was the man I was supposed to marry. And then when he got married, I didn't come out of my room for a week. I had a big Bon Jovi poster in my room. You know, I only had two posters. You know, one was Carol Alt and Bon Jovi. Carol had a better ass. <laughs> well, that John Bon Jovi has a good ass. Slippery When Wet's gritty attitude spoke to millions back in 1986 and still strikes a chord today. They were carrying the torch for a really small state. I feel like, like yeah, I'm from Jersey. I kind of want to be part of that whole tradition that those guys set up. Slippery When Wet was a shout of celebration from a hard-working band that had finally found its voice. We realize with being who we are and not trying to be anything else, you sink or swim on that. Don't chase something you're not because you're going to be a day late. The album is rooted in the industrial town of Saville, New Jersey, where John Bon Jovi grew up. You can't drive down the turnpike 
and drive by Sarahville and not go, oh, it's Joey's from there, you know, whatever. Everybody's ethnic backgrounds were Italian and Polish and Irish, and we all came from the same kind of family background. Everybody had to work hard, nobody had money, but nobody uh, wanted for food on the table either. While still at school, John served his time playing venues along the New Jersey shoreline. It was all about playing, you know, and, and learning the craft of writing songs. The first time I saw John perform, he was like a wild man, and the girls went nuts, and I wasn't used to seeing that. John also worked as a runner at a New York City recording studio. By night, he cut demos and dreamt of making it into the big time. When I wrote Runaway prior to even having the band, I was, you know, a, a kid trying to get a record deal, hustling around as every young kid does. In 1983, John's song Runaway made it onto a New York radio station's annual compilation of local bands. Runaway slowly filtered onto national stations and eventually caught the ear of Mercury Records' Derek Shulman. I listened to this song and uh, I said, this is great, what is this, who is this? John quickly signed a deal with Mercury Records and formed a band with four pals from the New Jersey scene. Guitarist Richie Sambora, keyboardist David Bryan, drummer Tico Torres and bassist Alec John Such. By early 1984, Bon Jovi's self-titled debut was released. Runaway was a minor top 40 hit. It cracked the top 40. It did extremely well in the Northeast. It was um, a good record, not a huge record. There was little space for Bon Jovi's hard rocking melodies amid airwaves clogged by repetitive pop and disco favorites. Lacking an obvious niche, Bon Jovi aligned themselves with a blossoming metal movement. We opened up for everybody from Judas Priest to Scorpions, so we had to have that big sound, yet we had this pop thing going. They're singing, you know, kill your mom, kill your mom. And we're singing, ooh, she's a little runaway. She's a little runaway. I mean, the, they were thrown at us. They would take, you know, two kids, like, hey, give me a hand with this. Like, yeah! Our goal at the end was to actually get all those fans to like us. Bon Jovi quickly recorded their second album to capitalize on the success of Runaway. Released in 1985, 7,800 degrees Fahrenheit captured the band in the middle of an identity crisis. It was very difficult um, because we didn't really know what it was, what was expected of us. Do we have a voice in the marketplace? You know, do we need to write 10 Runaways or are we going to say something else? The band's uncertainty was reflected in music videos memorable for questionable costumes and dubious storylines. 24 hours, boys. If you ever wanted to torture me, make me watch the videos from the first two records. Is everybody feeling good? Yeah! Man, you sold us out. Videos, the, the ones we did earlier, uh, they were horrendous. Our earlier videos were actually pretty goofy. <laughs> I definitely look goofy in most of them. We didn't know any better. Richie still kicks me in the ass. Made me wear a jumpsuit. <laughs> you know, you're wearing purple leather pants. I go, I know, I know. With 7,800 degrees failing to take off, Bon Jovi was once again forced to open for bigger, more popular bands. I think John probably was a little concerned at the time that, that he was going to be forever the opening band. There was a certain level of popularity, but as a business, Bon Jovi was struggling. After two moderately successful albums, it was time for Bon Jovi to really deliver. We knew that the all-important third album was a situation where you were going to achieve greater success like your peers were having, or 
you'd be relegated to the theater circuit. We needed to pull this next album through to make sure that there was going to be a Bon Jovi and there was going to be a band. And at that point, I felt that it was do or die. By the end of 1985, Bon Jovi was still locked firmly in the opening slot. The band was teetering on the edge of rock and roll obscurity. We were constantly winning the fight live and drawing people to the shows, but we weren't getting the play that we thought we deserved with um, MTV or with radio. We played pay toilets and use our own change, we used to say. Just played everywhere, open up for everyone. We got off the road and we all had no money and we were paying our crews more than we were making ourselves, so uh, we were living at mom and dad's. In early 1986, John Bon Jovi and Richie Sambora began writing the songs that would become Slippery When Wet in the basement of the Sambora family home. His folks both worked. And so the house was empty. I would drive over there in my little Datsun 280Z, which was like my bad ride, you know. I gave John like a key today, and he'd come like knocking on the door or whatever at like 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Here's some pizza, wake up, it's 1 o'clock, you know, we gotta go do something productive today. I lived next to a swamp on a dead end street. So the basement was half underwater sometimes, and it was really, really cold. It was a cement basement with a low ceiling with the two by fours in the insulation hanging overhead and the washing machine going. We'd get two guitars and a small cassette tape player and just start running ideas. We'd write till six when his folks came home for dinner and, and we'd call it a day. In the Sambora cellar, John and Richie drew upon their extensive touring adventures for inspiration. Most of our grown-up life were, was lived on the road. Uh, basically all we knew about was kind of like young love, young lust. <laughs> Being a rock and roll star and uh, wanted that or alive was like, almost like a diary of what we felt like. You don't know where you are. You're living in truck stops, sleeping on the bus. You know, you shower at a gig. You felt like you were living in a bubble. I started to, you know, talk to Richie about the concept. And just like magic, he just played and 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 walked it down. I went, there we go. Now we're talking. And we knocked it out in two, three hours. Wanted Dead or Alive compared the life of a touring musician to that of a Wild West outlaw. He would be given the opportunity to ride into a town, steal money, you know, take the women and get gone before the law found out. During the writing process, John and Richie collaborated with songwriter Desmond Child. The New Yorker got a crash course in New Jersey reality upon his first visit. I had rented a car and driven out to where they, where they were in the middle of this gray industrial marsh and there was this little wooden house and in the distance you could see oil refineries and these ominous smokestacks. Richie's bedroom had posters of, of you know, heroes and swimsuit models and a floor to ceiling, just a typical, you know, teenage uh, guy's bedroom. The chemistry between the three was immediate. On their first afternoon together, they crafted a future classic. I pulled out the title, You Give Love a Bad Name, and John's face lit up as the first time I saw the million dollar smile, multi-million dollar smile. He instantly uh, sang out, shot through the heart and you're to blame, and then the three of us uh, uh, together sang, you give love a bad name. And uh, that was a magical moment, and it all unfolded from there. It was 
somewhat nursery rhyme-ish, you know, it was something that you'd want to play live, you know, because it was tongue-in-cheek, and you're 25, and you're laughing, and it's, in, it's fun, it's goofy. John Bon Jovi, Richie Sambora, and Desmond Child completed the writing of Living on a Prayer in the space of a few hours. A tale of hard luck lovers, the anthemic song had a universal ring. We all have been Tommy and Gina at some point. We all felt like that. We've all been in that place where you're struggling together and all you got is each other. We got each other and that's the life of love. We'll give it a shot. With his catchy lyrics and infectious chorus, Living on a Prayer had all the makings of a hit. But John wasn't convinced. I remember getting in the cab with Richie, we were going somewhere, and my saying to him, yeah, it's okay. And I said, you know what, John, that might have been the best song we've ever written so far. Yeah, maybe it's for a soundtrack. It's not that good. And it's hard to sing the notes at the end. <laughs> I just looked at him, I said, that's a number one song. In the spring of 1986, Bon Jovi recorded demos for their new album at Century Productions, a small studio in the heart of Saville, New Jersey. The tracks in progress were previewed for the harshest critics in town, a group of teenagers who hung out at the nearby pizzeria. Ah, the pizza palajuri. Even though they weren't letting the marketing guy hear these new demos, or, or the promotion guy, or the head of the company, they were playing these demos to kids in the area. You always ask your friends, but uh, this was actually kids in a pizza parlor. We'd take a break and walk around the corner of the pizza parlor. And we were a little bit known by the locals. And it wasn't that they sat there and voted, yeah, I like it. You know, I, I don't, it doesn't suck. You know, it was more like that kind of comment. It doesn't suck. I think Living on a Prayer might not have made that record had it been for the Pizza Pie Jury. Boosted by the Pizza Parlor Jury, Bon Jovi enlisted Canadian producer Bruce Fairbairn to record their crucial third album. He had made some records with Loverboy, obviously. We liked the sound of the records that he produced. And if he could just lend that sonic perception to what we felt were these real, solid songs, we had a winner. Bruce relocated Bon Jovi to Vancouver to begin the sessions for what would become Slippery When Wet. It would prove a landmark moment and a time of unparalleled decadence. Despite two gold albums, Bon Jovi had yet to find their true voice or establish themselves as a major rock act. This record was gonna, you know, Slippery When Wet, un, yet untitled, obviously, was either gonna be the end of this band or the beginning of a new era. In the spring of 1986, with producer Bruce Fairbairn on board, the New Jersey boys took to the bright lights of Vancouver, Canada, to record Slippery. I think he also wanted to get us out of our element in New Jersey. You know, so he had a control because we were very out of control. Upon their arrival in Vancouver, the band crammed into a flat just down the street from Little Mountain Sound Studios. It was a pink, stucco, two-bedroom, plastic flamingos out in the front of the yard. People had saved up their whole lives to buy these places. And they, right in the middle unit, they're like, yeah, let's rent this out to a rock band. There goes the neighborhood. Debauchery was the rule at the Bon Jovi flat. But inside the studio, Bruce Fairbairn kept the band in line. Bruce Fairbairn was definitely a taskmaster. He was the adult. He was in charge of us all. He had lists and wrote everything down, and we're like, yeah, whatever, pal. He was unbelievably anal about how he kept charts with pretty pictures of, we did the drum track today, we're going to work on bar eight tomorrow, because that's not quite right yet, guys. Yet was giving us this great feeling of purpose, pride, and he believed in us to do what we did. Long hours locked up in the studio had the boys on edge. 
after work, they were unleashed on an unsuspecting Vancouver. We were usually done by 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, and to the guys from New Jersey, that was like getting out of school early. The band soon settled in and became well acquainted with the city's adult attractions. The girls in those strip bars in Vancouver were doing something that no girls were doing in, in New Jersey. This woman descended down from the ceiling on a pole and proceeded to take all her clothes off. Then get in a shower and soap herself up. I mean, they were naked in these showers for three songs a set all day long. We about, you know, lost our tongues. It'd be like, all right. We just sat there and said, we will be here every day. Lap dances were easy to find, but capturing Wanted Dead or Alive was a harder task. The song which had originally come together so easily in the Sambora cellar was proving elusive in the studio. We knew that the song was, was great, but we knew that we weren't capturing it. This was the gunfight. 